<clears throat> okay, we're in First Peter. This is a letter of the Apostle Peter. You have no option but to believe the Scriptures. Jesus did. Paul said that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. You cannot pick and choose. You cannot say, well, I think the millennium is false because Jesus didn't talk about the millennium. You're pitting Jesus against Jesus, spirit against spirit. That's not an option you have as a Christian. You either believe the words of the Bible, the prophets, the New Testament, the epistles of Paul, Peter, and so on, and the book of Revelation, which is only a complicated, somewhat difficult, but not impossible, account of Old Testament prophecy. About 440 references to the Old Testament prophets. So if you give up on the book of Revelation, then you give up on the prophets. You've thrown away the faith. You're not a believer and cannot claim to be so. So that's the approach that we take then to First Peter. Marvelously intense, brilliant stuff, by the way. Yes, this man was a fisherman, not trained officially in the schools, but he'd listened to Jesus, the brilliant rabbi, the Mozart of theology, who astonished the doctors, the PhDs of, of the day, with his questions at the age of 12. Peter was his student, and Peter had learned very, very well, and was permitted then to have his writings available to us in hundreds of languages, thousands of languages, the Bible being the bestseller by far. No other book has been explored as it has. And so with that approach, we come to the words of Peter. <clears throat> we'll see if we can get through half of chapter 2 of First Peter. That would take us down roughly to verse 20, 21, somewhere in there, maybe 20. Let's see how we do. First Peter 2. First Peter chapter 2. We had just finished reading about the seed, which is absolutely essential. And we were thinking just recently about how everything in this laboratory in which we've been placed is calculated to teach us spiritual truths, from waking up in the morning, going to sleep at night, from the ideas of fathers and mothers and marriage and reproduction of children and so on. Every imaginable thing we see in our environment is a spiritual lesson. So we're supposed to reflect on the spirit of life and the water of life. Every time we take a drink, every time we take food, we're imbibing physical food. We're talking about spiritual food in the Bible. Everything, the laboratory in which we live is calculated, designed by a loving father to teach us, look, the only thing that counts is your immortality. Nothing else counts. What are you going to do in 30 trillion years from now? That's the issue. I don't hear this discussed on Fox News. I don't know why. Rather, I look at 40,000 different denominations, all unable to agree. We're trying to add our little part then to trying to sort out some of that chaos. So, in 1 Peter 2, I'll start with the New American Standard Version. It's a good general translation. No translation is infallible, but it's better than the King James by no means insist on the King James, which is antiquated and is simply plainly wrong in some, some places. And by the way, they have discovered, I think rightly, that the proper pronunciation of Yahweh is probably Yehovah. There's a uh, Karite Jew, his name is Nehemiah, Nehemiah, and he's been looking at that closely. It doesn't matter because the New Testament makes no issue out of the Hebrew pronunciation, but probably Yehovah is right. Based on uh, Genesis, Exodus 3, but God declared his name as, I am what I am. Ehye asher ehye, I will be what I will be. And so they said, well, he is what he is. That's more or less Jehovah. It's based on the verb to be. So God is the one who just is. Isn't that beautiful? I will be what I will be. I've always been what I was, and I will always be what I will be, and I am what I am. Jehovah is probably right. You have a Yod in Hebrew, you have a Vav in Hebrew, so Jehovah if your interest is probably right, comes into the New Testament as the Lord, capital L-O-R-D. So nobody bothered pronouncing it in the New Testament times. It was actually illegal to do so. For your interest, Yehovah is probably right. Yahweh is fine if that's your preference, but it probably isn't the closest. Hmm. All that's based on the verb to be. I am what I am. So guess what? When people hear Jesus saying, I am, they say, there you go, he's God. That is foolish ignorance. Jesus didn't go around saying, I'm God, I'm Yahweh. That's just absurd. That would make two Yahwehs and the universe would fall. Jesus wasn't that unintelligent. So when he says, I am, this is mistranslated in your Bible. It should be, I am he, I'm the one. 
First example of that is when he encounters a lady from Samaria, they believe the Messiah was coming. And she said to him in a, in a brief conversation, he wasn't supposed to be talking to ladies on, on his own probably, but he did anyway, broke the protocol of the time. And she said, we know the Messiah is coming. This is in John 4, the first occurrence of the I am statement. She says, we know the Messiah is coming. And Jesus looks her in the eye. Can you imagine that moment and said, the one speaking to you is it. I am he, ego imi. I am the one, the Messiah in context, not God. He didn't just turn to say, well, by the way, I'm God. That's just madness. That's to turn the Bible into nonsense. No, I'm the Messiah. That's what counts in your belief system, that you believe he's the Messiah, the son of the living God, not that he is God. So, you can get rid of that. You'll read the Bible with clear and intelligent understanding. Back then to Peter, and um, it says in chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore, in view of what he's been talking about, having been born again, and you have to be born again now, don't believe anybody who says you can't be born again until the resurrection. That's false. You've got to start now and be born again now. You've been born again. Therefore, putting aside all malice, all wickedness, and all deceit, and hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander. Verse 2, sir. Like newborn babies, long for the pure milk, milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, it but is choice and precious in the sight of God. And now God is building you as living stones into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are God's holy priests who <coughs> offer the spiritual sacrifices that please him because of Jesus Christ. For this is contained in scripture. Quote, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. Verse 8. For them he also, he is also a stone that makes people stumble, a rock that makes people fall. Yeah. People stumble because they don't obey what God says. This is what God planned to happen to those people. Okay, let's, let's pause there. First of all, that translation is weak in yeah, verse 8. Uh, disobedient at the word, not just what God said. There's a constant tendency in preaching and commentary to waffle away key terms like the word of the gospel, which is the gospel of the kingdom. So, they stumble because they are disobedient to the word of the kingdom. Every time you come to the word as the gospel, you should think of the word of the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 13, 19, in all your teaching, you go back to the start, the foundation of all teaching is the gospel of the kingdom. So, rather than just vaguely what God said, well, God said a lot of things, we get that, but we don't get clearly the word of the kingdom as the basis. So, let's look at that, see what you would like to say. Therefore, in view of all the brilliant theological material, not boring theological material, but vital, life-giving theological material in chapter 1, you are to put aside all malice, all kakia, all evil. Boy, that's quite a, quite a high challenge, isn't it? What do we say in English? Quite a high something. Bar. A high bar. The bar is set extremely high. If you are God, you have the right to make the rules. And if you're selecting your elect people to rule the world with Jesus in the coming kingdom, you have a right to set the Navy SEAL standard extremely high. I learned this week that Navy SEALs are expected to eat out of garbage containers. Can they do it? It shows a sort of character and iron will to do things that are difficult. They were talking about waterboarding. And that can happen too to people. They'll be tortured and yet don't give up the faith. And that's admirable if you're choosing the Navy SEALs. Okay, so that's then malice and deceit. Hypocrisy, which is play-acting, envy, and all slander. Let me add here that slander does not mean judging correctly. It's commonly said today, you're not to judge, and that's taken to be, you're not to slander. You're not ever to say what's right and wrong. You cannot point out to somebody kindly that they are completely mistaken. That's not slander. That's facing reality. And if you don't do that, then you are guilty for not telling them. So there's a lot of nonsense talked about not judging. Yes, we shouldn't be 
overcritical, highly critical, that's true. But we certainly should make judgments because Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine. That's a huge judgment. You first decide that person's a swine, then you decide not to cast your pearl in front of him. So watch out for the misuse of don't judge. <coughs> Very common in our conversation these days. Okay. Newborn babes. I like that. Just been talking about being born again. Now, is that a fetus in the mother's womb? I don't think so. A newborn babe clarifies what it means to be born again. You've got to be born again now, John 3. That's the equivalent of receiving the seed message of the kingdom in the Gospels. Think about this, that Jesus, in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, never mentioned being born again. And yet John did. John said, if you're not born again, you aren't going anywhere fast, as they say in Georgia. You're getting nowhere. Well, what about Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Did he not mention being born again? Of course he did. But under a different parable, a different comparison, namely that of seed growing in the ground, as distinct from seed growing in the womb of a mother. That's very easy. <coughs> okay. Newborn babes. Longing. That sounds like a, a real desire, doesn't it? Longing for the pure milk of the word. The milk there shows we're not talking about fetuses. You see, that should have been quite clear to some of us in many years past. We were not thinking. We were under the grip of a guru who dictated what we believe. We weren't alive in thinking. Now we see it. As a newborn babe, longing for the pure milk of the word, of the gospel, so that by it you may grow into salvation. So it doesn't happen the moment you believe. You then you ought to go forward, and there are different standards in the church. Paul dealt with a lot of people who were beginners who hadn't got to the required standard. Sometimes he was generous to them. He said, if you want to keep a certain day, that's all right. If your conscience says you can't eat pork, go for it. But later on in Galatians, when people try to change the whole church and disturb it, then he came on very tough. He said, if you are going to get circumcised physically, he's talking to everybody there, not just Jews, as to think from Gentiles. If you are going to insist on circumcision, then you're going to have to keep the whole law. Don't do it. Don't get circumcised. Don't keep the whole law. So he immediately said, what law is he talking about? Well, not the law of adultery, for goodness sake. That's obvious. So I want to make the point that in the church, there are different levels of understanding. You don't discard people because they step out of line. You bring them along, you work with them. Now, if they then turn against the whole church and undo your whole effort, that's a different thing. But differences of, of standard in, in vegetarianism and so on are, are permissible. You think that wine is a sin? It's not, actually. But if you think it is, that's your conscience, you go with it. Paul doesn't kick you out immediately for that, but he certainly begs you to, to move forward. By the way, the yes. early church... Mm -hmm represented by the so-called church fathers. Yes. Talk a lot about being born again mm -hmm. uh, through uh, baptism. Good. Yes. Uh, so you got Justin Martyr. Yes. There's a quote here if I could bring it up. He says, Then they are brought by us, yeah. so these are converts yeah. to the faith, where there is water and are born again. Mm -hmm. For they then receive washing in water in the name of God the Father, Mm. and Master of all, and our Savior Jesus Christ, and of the Holy Spirit. For yep. Christ also said, except you are born again, mm -hmm. if you're not born again, mm -hmm. you will not enter into the kingdom That's of right. heaven. Well, what they've done there is to, is to sell it on to baptism. Baptism is certainly part of the regenerative process. Absolutely right. But the tendency there was to make baptism a sort of magical formula. It became that later on, and then they actually resorted to baptizing infants who had no concept of the faith, so the whole thing fell apart later. But that's called baptismal regeneration, and it's true that baptism is part of the obedience of faith. And so if you shake your fist at baptism, you're shaking your fist at Jesus, who got baptized himself. He actually baptized more converts than John did. Baptism is part of what you do. It's like saying, well, I'm getting, going to get married, but I'm not going to have a ceremony. That's not the best idea. Baptism in water for adults is simply what you do. And since salvation is given to those who obey Jesus, <coughs> Hebrews 5, 9, text that doesn't get much used, salvation is given to those who obey Jesus, it's not advisable to shake your fist at Jesus and say, no, I don't think baptism counts. It absolutely does count. By the way, yes. the martyr quote, mm -hmm. the, what Jesus says here. Yes, born uh, again. If you're not born again, yeah. you will not. It sounds like John 3. It does. Uh, and in John 3, 5, mm -hmm. yes. 
amen, I say, or mm -hmm. truly I mm -hmm. say, unless a person is born of water and yeah. spirit, yeah. he cannot, or right. they cannot enter into sounds the Sounds like an absolute standard for baptism. So it's not the only sounds like baptism it to does. me. It does, absolutely. It's not the only thing. You've got to believe in the gospel of the kingdom, not just the magic touch of baptism, but yes, certainly. It's not something to argue about, it's just simply what needs to be done. That's quite clear. What else we got here? Newborn babe, then. Growing, you've got to grow up, and people are at different levels of understanding. If you have tasted the kindness of the Lord, I think we all have. We've tasted how kind God has been to us, put up with us as we fumbled our way through Bible studies over many years, fell for the guru, very often a very corrupt guru, who was sexually out of control, and we fell for all that, because we were told that we're supposed to keep the Ten Commandments, for example, and the fourth one says you should rest on Saturday. It does. What we were not told is that the Ten Commandments written in stone at Sinai are the Old Covenant, now passé, now finished. So, the artist who obeyed the Ten Commandments in the spirit and not in the letter. That was clever, because we didn't know that distinction that Paul makes clearly between the law of Messiah in 1 Corinthians 9.21 and the law of Moses. A huge distinction. So don't insist on Sabbath keeping, don't insist on the holy days, because you're taking your back, yourself back away from Christ who has come. He's your Sabbath, he's your holy days. Don't go back under the shadow of the old covenant, because you're then mixing the covenants and that's not going to be very good for your spiritual health. Okay, what else have we got here? Verse 4, coming to him. Verse 2. Yes, please. The, uh, I've got some footnotes here. Mm. It says, where it says that you may grow in respect to salvation. Yes. Um, now I have into salvation mm -hmm. written in, the yeah. back where I wrote it. Like yes. You taught that. Yes. But also in the footnote down here in the Bible, it says, um, Logikos. Logikos, it says for yes. up to salvation. Yes. That you may grow up to salvation. Yes, it's future here, salvation. You're growing towards salvation and into it. There's a sense, of course, in the Bible in which we have been saved. When we were saved, is right. Very importantly, we are being saved, often missing, missing in a translation, and most often we are going to be saved at the second coming or uh, when we get resurrected from the dead. So it's all, all three times. Saved. Yes, all three. All three tenses of the verb people have said. That's not difficult. And recently some people from the Spirit and Truth Fellowship have seen that once saved, always saved, is a flat-out falsehood. That shouldn't have been difficult because Paul did say, if you Christians don't stay within the faith, you'll get cut off. That's not what saved, always saved. One verse should have been enough, but they wrote a rather laboured treatise on this, and I'm glad they did to get it straight. And now they see that salvation re requires persistence onwards to the end of the race. Growing. Growing. Growing growing into salvation. I think this should cause us to be patient with other people and patient with ourselves sometimes even. It's a process and we are at different levels. Paul spoke in Corinthians about some who were novices. He didn't kick them out for being novices. <coughs> he allowed them to be in the group but he's hoping they'll come forward and where once he said okay to be a vegetarian if that's your choice, okay to insist on not having pork if that's your choice, okay but once you start making that a dogma and insisting on keeping the Sabbath and losing your job over it, keeping the Holy Days and losing your job over it, then you've fallen way outside the perimeter that Paul allows. That's very clear. Get real, grow up, do your study, and get the truth in every respect. I think he's his point there. Okay. Now, in verse 5, your identity, who are you as a Christian? You also, as living stones, hence the surname Livingston, living stones are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Isn't that exactly the laboratory in which you are working out in Christianity? You look at the temple building and say, I see that, that's a physical building. You look at the priests in the temple offering their sacrifices and you see all the ritual of the Old Testament in your Bibles in the Old Testament. You say, okay, I get it. This is me now. I'm supposed to learn from that that I am what that was pointing to. I am the one offering prayers and spiritual sacrifices. I'm a temple as a Christian. I'm a temple being built up 
acceptable to God through Jesus Messiah, the one God the Father and Jesus Messiah over and over again. I get that. Again then, this is the picture of life. Everything we experience in life, sleep, rest, getting up in the morning, going to bed at night, eating, drinking, praying and so on, all of that is reflected in the environment, <coughs> environment which we have been graciously put by the Creator. He gives us every opportunity to compare the trees, for example, the grass outside, the flowers that wither, every possible thing, cleansing ourselves. Rabbis have special prayers for that part department of life even. Everything we do should reflect on the only question that matters, am I going to live forever and ever and ever? That's the question. So in Zion you've got a choice stone, this is Jesus, an elect stone, a precious cornerstone. The cornerstone I gather, I'm not an architect at all, but that's the basic cornerstone that you lay at the foundation to give you the measurement for the rest of the building. And what else do we have? He who believes in him will not be disappointed. But those who refuse to believe in Jesus will be terribly ashamed, Jesus said. Those who don't believe what I say, Jesus said, I'll be terribly ashamed of him. Let me quote that exactly. In the Gospels you have this. He who is ashamed of me and my teachings compared with the quotations I read earlier on. He was ashamed of me and my teachings. I'll be terribly ashamed of him when I come back. Get out of here. I never knew you. So without the teachings of Jesus, you are not getting salvation. That's very clear. Is, it, it, yeah. is this a reference also to what Jesus says, um, Matthew, this stone yeah. imagery yeah. about Matthew 21? Yes. Uh, let's see. 42? Yeah. So it's a stone that also crushes yes. people, 44. Yes. He who falls on this stone will yes. be broken to yes. pieces. Yeah. But on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. Is this the same? I'm sure it's the same idea. It's from Daniel 2.44, where the kingdom of God will come intervening into the kingdoms of this present evil system. And if it crushes you, that's terrible. So it's not just a stumbling a stumbling thing, it's also right. a destroying thing. It can be destructive if you don't accept it, it can destroy you, absolutely. Hopefully you trip over it and pick up yourself and go on, that's the positive mm -hmm. idea there. But it also has a destructive effect if you don't accept it, I suppose. Hence Luke 19, 27, bring my enemies in front of me, Jesus said, and slaughter them in my presence. That's a verse that doesn't get a lot of press, you get a selective uh, amount of verses from Jesus, not so, often Luke 19, 27. So actually, yeah. in Matthew 21, Jesus quotes this mm -hmm. passage, the stone which he, the builders rejected, yes. etc. Has become the and cornerstone. The end of this chapter says, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard yes. his parables, they understood yes. that he was speaking about them. So he got from... They finally got it. Yes. What is the statement in modern preaching? He went from preaching to meddling. Mm -hmm. He went from preaching to meddling. Very direct, and well, they understood. They, they would have understood. Yes. I mean, they knew this scripture. It's from Isaiah 28, 16. Yes, please, read that for Therefore, us. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm laying a, in Zion a stone, mm -hmm. a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. Marvelous. It will, I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness mm -hmm. the level. Yes. And um, anyway, he goes on. You can keep reading there. It yes. It's a lot about um, the stone and his building of. Interesting. Architectural parallel, isn't it? So architecture doesn't get left out of the environment that God has graciously provided for us. That everything we do and look at teaches us a spiritual lesson. That, that's a very good idea. Okay, so you're absolutely right. They understood. In verse 8, a stone of stumbling mm -hmm. and a rock of offense. Yes. 1 Corinthians 1.23 says, But we preach Christ crucified yes. to Jews a stumbling block mm -hmm. and to Gentiles foolishness. Yes. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Absolutely right. Those who are called. And that doesn't mean that that calling is irrevocable. It's not Calvinism. There was a feeling in some circles that if God didn't call you, you weren't getting anywhere. But God wants all men everywhere to be saved. 1 Timothy 2, 4 and 5. The gospel is extended to everyone, and some people respond with God's grace, that's true, 
But the truth falls, as Jesus said, on a good and honest heart sometimes. The Bereans were more noble. They weren't in Calvin's system pre-elected or something like that. So yes, there is a calling from God, but there's also a cooperative element in your choice to decide God, uh, for God or against him. Just want to add that there. And what else do we have uh, in 7 here? The value of oh, that translation is not so good. This precious value, it should be this precious, this precious honor. Mm -hmm. The Bible is very shy, the <coughs> translations of the Bible are very shy about crediting you with anything. Why? Well, because the devil's not keen on what you're doing, and so the translators mess with it. So that should read then, this precious honor is for you, right? This precious honor is for you. Where it says, mine says value? Yes, no, 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 honor. Mm -hmm. Honor for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, there's the choice, they're, they're cho chose not to believe. The stone which the builders rejected, that's Messiah, has become the foundation of everything. So you trip over him, you can pick up yourself and move on, or you can allow yourself to be crushed entirely. The Jews as a whole have not believed in the Messiah. Now you could say that because a Trinitarian God has been presented to them, they have some excuse for failure there. However, they're not going to be judged by the churches, they're judged by the message and the words of Scripture. If they look carefully, they would see that Jesus is a unitary monotheistic Jew, not certain not Trinitarian, so their excuse would be removed from not believing his claim. Stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. I get it. They stumbled because they were disobedient to the gospel of the kingdom. Everything in the Bible is about obedience. From the start, the failure of man was, I'm not going to do what God says. The last verse in Revelation more or less says the same thing. So here's what gospel of the kingdom entails. It doesn't mean vaguely accept Jesus in your heart. Too vague. Well, accept him as one dying for you and rising. That's a good start. But it still doesn't get to the point. The gospel of the kingdom is the gospel about your destiny, which you failed in Adam. You failed to grasp it. We did. We're all corporate in Adam. We all failed to grasp our royal destiny because the first thing said to man was to rule the world. Rule the world for God. Be my agent. Be my co-king, co co-ruler, and rule the world. And Adam messed up. We all have. So then, the gospel of the kingdom is the reversal of that. Jesus is taking in the whole wide scope of, of the entirety of Scripture and saying, you lost your destiny as ruler for God. That's what Adam did, and you've all done the same. <coughs> so now turn around and stop not believing in the kingdom. It doesn't say, stop doing this and that evil. That's a good idea too. Stop being drunk, absolutely. Stop lying and cheating, absolutely. But the point is, stop losing out on your destiny as royal ruler as prescribed for Adam and failed and Jesus comes along as the model, the second Adam. If you say he's God, you've killed that idea. You can't be God and man at the same time. 100% God and 100% man doesn't work. You cannot be man and not a man. That's what you believe in church if you're going to one of the regular churches. That's not right. He's a fully human being, supernaturally begotten in the womb by miracle in Mary, sinless, and God's appointed model, second Adam. That's wonderful. He's doing exactly what Adam didn't do. And we're to follow that as the model. I get it. It's much broader than just Jesus loves you, you know, believe in him vaguely. That's too vague. So believing the gospel of the kingdom is right. And then you get to verse 9. You are... We haven't read that part. We haven't, haven't read 9? We should. Okay, let's do 9. Let me do 9 and I'll start to do 10. You are... A chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Verse 10. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Okay, let's pause there a moment. I need to correct some wrong ideas that float. Despite the obvious fact that they're not true, it has been said that you, when you say Israel, you must only mean now ethnic Israel, a flesh and blood Jew. That, unfortunately, would throw away your identity. 
you are, you international church, are the Israel of God. You're the people of God. You're the holy nation. All of those marvelous positions before God outlined in the Old Testament are now dumped upon you. That's absolutely fundamental. Take that away and you've thrown away your identity to an unconverted Jew. Yes, we know there's a future. This is a different topic. There's a future for now blinded ethnic Jews. We know that. They're going to come to some sort of recovery. That's absolutely true. But for the moment, your identity is the people of God, the priests, the kings, all of those marvelously privileged titles in the Old Testament belong to you. You're the kings, the priests, and the nation. Is it fair to say yes. that the Old Testament is a story about Israel, yeah. one Israel, mm -hmm. and that the New Testament gives us a story about two Israels? Well, two Israels, if you carefully mean the present Israel, which is well, the exception of all make that, the yes. Right. The distinct yes, there are two Israels, but provided you don't model them chronologically, that's fine, but people will take advantage of that sometimes. Yes, there are two Israels in the sense of, in a, a linear sense, there's a future for now blinded Israel. They're not Israel now. Those Jews who have not accepted Messiah are no way God's people, except, you might say, potentially in prophecy. But for the moment, that identity belongs to you. You're the children of Abraham, so those who curse Abraham are cursing you. Those who bless Abraham are blessing you. You must not throw away your identity as the people of God to a yet unconverted nation. I think that's very important, and most people understand that well. Uh, you were once not a people, I get it. We were all drifting in various directions before conversion, but now you are the people of God. Isn't that great? You are the people of God. Right out of Hosea. Right out of Hosea. And what's so fascinating, Michelle, is that there in Hosea, Paul is talking about, or Hosea rather, is talking about Israel, flesh and blood. Time. At that time, they're not God's people, and they're still not God's people, but in a prophecy, yet in the future, they will all turn to be God's people. Meanwhile, guess what's happened? The kingdom of God has been taken away from you, Jesus said, in the most awful sense, and given to a nation bearing its fruit. That has to be the international church. So what kind of responsibility is that? Very, very high, would think. You are the people of God. You've not received mercy. You hadn't until you got converted. But now... You have received mercy. I think all of us in our hearts know we've received a lot of mercy. I don't know how God put up with us or puts up with us sometimes, but he does. We're his children and fathers with this extraordinary power to love his creation do put up with their children despite their failings. Otherwise we don't do that. Hosea. Please do. From Hosea 2, yes. starting at 21. Yes. Because you can tell that this is for the future. Absolutely. And earlier in Hosea 1, mm -hmm. he, he does quote that same thing about, you, were, um, you are not my mm. people and I'm not your God. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yet the numbers of the sons of Israel will be like the sands of the sea, yes. which cannot be measured or numbered. And, you know. Yes. But then later on here in verse 21, it's 221. Yes. It says, it will come about in that day. Yes, so we know future that's day. Later. That's right. That I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the heavens, and they will respond to the earth. Yes. The earth will respond to the grain and the new wine and the oil and to Jezreel. I will sow her for myself in the yes. land. I will have compassion on her. Wonderful. And I will say to those who were not my people, yes. you are my people. Yes. And they will say, you are my God. That's wonderful. It's so clever so that Paul can use God. that, which originally applied to national Israel, now applies to us, us. and still will apply in a future time to now blinded Israel. This is not hard unless you try to pick and choose and separate and don't forget that Jews grasp a totality. Paul can use Israelite texts and apply them to us. I love that. That gives us sort of room to breathe and, and enjoy what's being said there. Okay, you're exactly right. All that's in capital letters in my NASU because they're quoting from Hosea in a most interesting way. 11 says... Have we read 11 or not? We're at 10. We're at 10. For you once were not a people, as indeed Israel has continued to be not a people. Sorry, 11. 11. Now you are the people of God. That's marvelous. You've received mercy. Now you have received mercy. Okay, 11. <coughs> Who's got 11? Uh, dear friends, I beg you, as foreigners and spiritual resident aliens, mm -hmm. to abstain from the lusts of human nature which battle against you. Mm -hmm. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, 
they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Yes, okay, let's pause there. So you are resident aliens, you're green card people. I particularly can sense that because I am a green card person. I haven't bothered, as I've said before, I haven't bothered to get a, an official citizenship in America, having lived here since 1981. But why would I bother? Because I drive on the same wrong side of the road as you people do and pay the same taxes, so it's partly laziness, but it also gives me a, a theological platform that we are resident aliens. I don't get to vote. That's all right. I don't get to vote. I have every other privilege. I have the protection of the law here. The law will be right at the door to defend me if somebody tries to attack me on religious grounds. That's wonderful. I'm very proud, in, in the right sense, to be resident in a most amazing country, which has its faults, of course, as well. But that's exactly what we are, aliens and strangers. Your passport reads, firstly, kingdom of God. <clears throat> Secondly, the kingdom in which you happen to be resident. So, we're to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the self, the soul, the psyche, is the soul, the self, the whole person. Waging war? What? That's pretty powerful. You're in a battle against all the lusts that are put out on television endlessly, all the pleasures of this life which can be abused so easily, all the tendencies to be uh, ostentatious when there's no reason for that, and whatever application you make in your own mind to yourself there, Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Isn't that good? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So people say, yes, he's a good person. He's an honest person. You are reliable. When you say you're going to do something, you actually do it. We had an episode yesterday where a man was going to shop and fix something for us and didn't shop. And I thought, he needs a lesson. You're not going anywhere fast. How can God rule the world with you if you cannot even be faithful in certain things? Impossible. You're out. You're disqualified. <coughs> so we have to be patient with people, I get it, but we're supposed to be excellent in the, in the view of the world. Just, Anthony, yes. just a couple of things. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter is repeating a lot of the things he said in chapter 1. Yes, he is. And we have to keep in mind <coughs> the letter, this whole letter, yep. book, starts with uh, to God's uh, people who are dispersed. Yes. He says in verse 1, yes. chapter 1, you who are away from your homes. Good. So there are people in Pontus, Galatia, yes. etc. So the theme here is uh, you are all dispersed, mm -hmm. but uh, you know uh, the the kingdom is coming, mm -hmm. right? I'll so always. and not just that. Then he goes into his whole what I call supremacy mm -hmm. uh, theme, <clears throat> the supremacy of Israel. Mm -hmm. So if I can share a couple of verses mm -hmm. here, Deuteronomy twenty six eighteen. Yes. The Lord has today declared you to be His people, a treasure possession, as He promised you, and that you should keep all His commandments. Yes. And then 19, and that He will set you above all nations, which He has made for praise, fame, and honor. Yes. And that you shall be a consecrated people to the Lord your God, as He has spoken. Mm -hmm. So, Excellent. that's the theme here, Peter. Tell it's me. the same one in Deuteronomy, the same one in, yes. in Hosea, yes. etc. It, the uh, supremacy aspect. So, yes. what does that look like? What is honor, glory yeah. in the kingdom? Yes. What What is that? And then I'll give you yes. a couple more. Verses. Exodus 19, so, you're going to cover, I'm sure, too. So, you okay. got. Uh, Exodus 19, if he does. Yes, okay. <laughs> Between you, you'll do it well. So, as you probably know by now, I'm very fond of what's called the imprecatory psalms. And there's uh, Psalm 149. Uh, verse 6, let the people shout praise to God with a sharp sword in their hand. Let them take revenge on the other nations. Let them go punish those people. They will put their kings in chains and their leaders in chains of iron. They will punish those nations as God commanded. This is an honor mm -hmm. for all his followers. Yes. So what is honor, glory, mm -hmm. what is supremacy in the kingdom? Well, it involves that. It includes um, that, certainly, but it's not the only that, thing. Sorry. Right. Uh, Jesus <coughs> says in Luke 19, 27, a very mm -hmm. harsh verse, mm -hmm. Jesus says, bring my enemies before me. So uh, my point is that we, we talk about honor and glory and all that, but we need to explain also what that will look like mm -hmm. in the kingdom, that it, it, it means governing yes. this world. It bring, means bringing the wicked 
under chains and 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 they, and then it also means killing mm -hmm. the, the wicked mm -hmm. in the kingdom. And then the other verse I really love, <coughs> Isaiah forty five fourteen. Mm -hmm. This is a messianic view here. This is what God says: the prophet of Egypt, the money of Ethiopia along with the Sabaeans, those tall people will mm -hmm. be brought to you mm -hmm. and become your possession. Mm -hmm. So that's honor, glory. Uh, they will walk behind you, coming along in chains. There's a lot of chains, by the way, in the Psalms. <laughs> they will worship you yeah. and pray to you. Mm -hmm. Now that is pray, and yes. only the Net Bible has that translation, by the way, because yeah. they shy away from it. Why will they pray to us? Because truly God is with you. He has no peer. There is no other God. Right. Yeah, I don't think I would say I, I love those verses because it, it, it comes over as I can't wait to get even with my enemies. And that's harsh. not the right idea. Too harsh. It's too harsh if read alone. It has to be right. very severely balanced by the enormous compassion that will be extended by Christians at that the, time. The other thing here in Peter is a holy nation. Absolutely. So, again, these people are dispersed. Mm. Mm -hmm. And he says to them, guess what? You, you, are, you are citizens of yeah. a nation, yeah. but not the nations you're living in. That's right. Yeah. So is it fair to say that Christians are called to reject patriotism, nationalism? In well, in some, that's language? too strongly put, because you are to honor the authorities. <clears throat> I certainly would bow my head to the Queen if I met her. It must be balanced by the other side of that story, otherwise it comes over as harsh and condemnatory, I think. Imprecatory right, so psalms are those where you're praying vengeance on your enemies. Mm -hmm. Some of that Davidic stuff, I think, has been modified in the New Testament yeah. a little bit. Some of the Mount. So another favorite verse of yours, yeah. too, is Revelation 2. Yes. I will give power over the nations mm -hmm. to all those who win the victory, continue until the end to yes. do what I want. Yes. This is the easy to read version, by the way. Yes. They... Christians, yes. will rule the nations with an iron rod, yes. they will break them to yes. pieces yes. like clay pots, yes. and that's from the famous Psalm 2. Absolutely. Well. And that is also true, but if only, only said alone, it can give a, a wrong balance. It can give the impression of all I want to do is smash the nations. We've seen that. That was the Armstrong approach. So that I think any reference to any of that should be modified immediately in the same passage or in the same talk by a very clear idea that you ought to extend mercy to everybody now and at that time too. That's part of the story, but it's not the whole story. That's so. grace, honor, and glory in the kingdom. Of it is. And that's what he said in 1 Peter 1, as we point out, the translations are shy of that, and also shy of Daniel 7.27, which says that all nations are going to have to serve and obey the saints. I don't think that's the text to major on, because you'll give the wrong impression, they won't understand it, but that's what it says in 7.27 of Daniel. All nations and tongues and languages are going to have to obey, not just Jesus, I get that, but obey the saints. Translations are shy of that. RSV gets it right. Commentaries get it right. The people of God are going to be supreme. Supremacy. I get that. I mean, God can do it. The kingdom of priests is used all the time. What's that, no? The kingdom of priests. <coughs> yes, priests. Of So what exactly right. yes. does a priest do? Okay. I mean, point. I have in my head the, the Catholic priests. You yeah. know? So I'm sure that's not what is meant here no. when he's talking about us being priests. Right, priests are certainly not just taking vengeance on people. Yeah, that's that's sure. not true at all. They are interceding on behalf of human beings. They're operating between God and man. As a Catholic priest attempts to do that, in our opinion, not quite right, but priests and kings. I'm glad you mentioned it. Let's look at Revelation 1.6. Well, before then. you get to Revelation 1.6, yes. try, because yes. that's the next thing, mm -hmm. is in Exodus... Yes, 19, thank six. You. Yes, please read it. Please. It says, he's talking about in the third month after bringing them out of the, the Jews, <coughs> the Israelites mm -hmm. out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. It says, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Yes. And that's that's what he wanted. That's what God wanted all along. Exactly. Was these people that he created yes. to be priests. Yes. And, and kings. Which is hard for me to, to yeah. kind of grasp. Yeah. But um, holy nation, mm -hmm. I, get, I get that part. So I need more clarification. Well, I think the priest is somebody who is <coughs> teaching other people about God. Isn't that right? And anybody who shares that's, the gospel... That's, that's, so it means more um, teachers of yes. his word? That's Absolutely. That's kind of what you mean? That's sure. You're, you are intercessors. You are go-betweens between the one God of Israel and people who are ignorant and astray. And you're helping them. So there's a very positive yeah. thing there. 
teachers. Absolutely. Teachers of Instructors. Any, 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 well, any, yeah. well, and Jesus. then in First yeah. Peter, you know, he yes. talks about us being mm -hmm. um, priesthood, a royal priesthood and a holy nation, and then that's over in Revelation 1, 6. Absolutely. Jesus. Revelation 1, 6, and also 5, 10 is classic. 5, 10 of Revelation says that God has assembled all the people from different nations to be a kingdom of priests. That's a royal <coughs> priesthood. Yeah, priesthood is God. We're yes. actually supposed to be teachers and even healers in some sense yes. uh, by the preaching of the gospel yes. now, right. especially with the charismatic gifts that <coughs> the church had at mm -hmm. one point. Mm -hmm. And the teacher, you know, Jesus said, I will send you teachers, uh, yes. you know, prophets, etc. Mm -hmm. So even now that's supposed to be our Absolutely. role to the nations. Absolutely. Uh, and just quickly, and I don't know if we mentioned Daniel 2.44 in connection yes. to the stone. Yeah, read that for us, please. Uh, 2.44 of Daniel. So this is the famous vision. During the time of the kings of the fourth kingdom, mm -hmm. the God of heaven will set up another kingdom that will continue forever, will never be destroyed. It will be the kind of kingdom, this is the easy to read version, yes. that cannot be passed on to another group of people. Yes. This kingdom will... Crush yes. all the other a lot of crushing. Yes. It will bring to it, them to an end, but that kingdom itself will continue forever. It's beautiful. It doesn't get more basic than that. I never heard of that in the Church of England days ever. That then hooked us in the Armstrong days because the kingdom of heaven follows on four previous kingdoms. There are ten kingdoms in the last of the four kingdoms, and then the kingdom of God comes. That made complete sense to us, so and we it was right. This to the uh, cornerstone. Yes, of course. Because there's a mountain, right? Yes. The face of, of course. Mountain or something. Different images. Uh, stone is different pictures. <laughs> different pictures. You get what you can out of them. What do you think, Tom? Uh, getting back to the word priest. Yes. In the um, biblical <coughs> sense, yeah. it was the one that offered sacrifices. <coughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So how does that apply? To well, he talks about spiritual sacrifices. That would be not literal. We're not offering physical sacrifices, but the equivalent in a laboratory in which God's places would be praying for these people. Mm -hmm. That would be intercession by spiritual. Well, the sacrifice. temple. Because when he first designed people, yeah. when he first came up with the idea of people, yes. he didn't really have the idea of killing animals on an altar no. and stuff, right? That, no, that came, no. later. came later with the law of Moses. Black. Yeah. I mean, to no. me, I just think this is amazing. From the, the second book in the Bible to the very last book <clears> in the Bible, we're <throat> saying the same thing. God Absolutely. created us to be teachers of That's His right. Word. Let's say it that That's way. Right. To spread His Word, yes, to teach His yeah. Word and His plan to everybody. Which is a priestly activity. Yeah. Spiritual and, sacrifice would be praying for other holy, people. The Holy Kingdom. Can I go back to the, gonna happen, but just yeah. in the future. Just to Tom's point, Tom, uh, if we believe, I think we do as <clears> a group, I don't know the people online, in a third temple, Mm -hmm. in a messianic temple there will be priests in there doing s sacrificing yeah but for when you say third temple you must distinguish between the a, messianic temple and that, that's the fourth temple fourth, be the fourth yes. so there will be a, a, a reinstated <coughs> yes. sacrificial Absolutely. system with priests <laughs> yes I'm, that's not yeah but if it says God created us yes. every one of us right. is not going to be the one in there doing the sacrifices mm -hmm. take turns <laughs> yes. I thought it was only Jews who were going to be... Well, we're talking about two different things here. We're talking exactly about... The old days, there's no physical temple for us now. There's no physical temple priests. for us now. The temple is not there. Yes, we're we are not, priests. Without, a, without a physical it's temple, so of course. It can't be that. No physical temple for us now. No physical <laughs> sacrifices for us now. That's finished. But it will be reinstated in the millennium. That will be the fourth temple. And we believe that before the second coming, there will be a pseudo-temple that Jews will build. And the Antichrist will go and sit there. That's not going to affect All you. Right, that's the third. Yeah. That's the third. Yeah. We've had two. Be destroyed. Mm -hmm. That one will be destroyed. Then well, a Ezekiel forty one. Five of them in between. We just know there will be one. Yeah. 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 The, 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 it will be. The, actually, that's a good point. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Just because we think yeah. it's the next one, it might not. That's be right. Good. Well, people complain about our talking so, of a temple in Second Thessalonians, the temple. Note with the article. Paul says there will be the temple in which the man of sin will sit, claiming to be God. I'm not going to be interested in that. They'll get on with that. But that's just a fact of prophecy, apparently. Uh, just some comments here. Very Randy true. says, currently the broken <laughs> off Israel branches mm. are enemies of the gospel for our sake. Good point. But from the standpoint of God's choice, yes. 
They are beloved for the sake of the Father. It's Romans wonderful. 11, 28. That's, That's brilliant. That. Randy has put his finger as very often on the point. The art in Bible teaching is to get to the point. My point to you today is, <coughs> is that repent and believe in the kingdom means repent and get hold of the destiny that you lost in Adam. That's about as broad as you can get. So Randy's put his point on, on in Romans 11, 28. It's beautiful. At present, the Jews, the unconverted, whoever they are, and that's another issue, are they the Khazars pretending to be Jews? I don't know. That's an ethnic question quite beyond me. Wherever the true Jews are, the linear descendants of Judah, they are now enemies of God for the sake of the gospel. Can, can I read your paraphrase? Yeah. I think this captures it. Though they are at present yes. enemies of the saving gospel. Yes. And this is to your advantage, yes. Christians. Yes. They are still potentially mm -hmm. the chosen people mm -hmm. and loved because of their forefathers. I think that's you right. Added yes, I did. To try to get sense. Could you um, speak to the term replacement theology? Am I yes, exactly. Yourself? So replacement is right and wrong. Jesus did do replacement theology when he said, the kingdom of God is being taken away from you hostile Jews and given to a people bearing its fruit. That's the international church. That's replacement. But it's not replacement with no end in sight. There is a further point that has to be made about replacement. That that replacement is only until the full quota of Gentiles has come in, until requires and then in English until the full quota of Jews has come in, and then, thus actually, but the equivalent is then, all Israel, that would be not every Jew, just because it's a Jew, but a collective whole of Jews will be saved. That so the replacement is temporary. Yes, what did he say? Will the repentant Israel, when the Lord returns, yes, exactly. be given immortality? Or well, will they be the leading nation? I would think the they have nations? to learn it. Now, I would think they have to go through the process. They would probably account for the surviving nations Blessed are my people Israel, my people Egypt, my people Assyria. Whole nations will be converted, but they're still nations. They're in process, I would think. They're not in the first resurrection. They're not in the first resurrection. That's, that's exclusively for all the faith of all the ages, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the prophets, and the true church now. But there's a process going on there. How it ends, we'll wait and see. I don't and know. The 12 exactly. apostles will rule over Israel. So Absolutely. There will be some Israel to rule over. Absolutely. Well, it's then, a great I was going to say, when, when we teach uh, what I call the restoration mm -hmm. of the pagan nations, mm -hmm. uh, Israel is in there. Yeah. Uh, there has to be, because Jesus said to the apostles in mm -hmm. Matthew 19. Yes. Uh, where is it? 19. 28. 28. Mm -hmm. uh, all those. No. 19. 28. Mm hmm. Anyway, he said you, you will right be there. enthroned yes. to govern yes. or rule the, the 12 tribes. That's right. So that, that's why I'm, I said earlier that it seems to me the Old Testament is a story about the one Israel Absolutely. of God. But then in the New Testament, yeah. we get part of the what, what's called the secret yeah. mystery of, yeah. of... Gentiles included in the, in the Israel of God. Yeah, we've got two Israels now because yeah. mm -hmm. uh, one is the remnant... Mm -hmm. God has a remnant, by the way, for every p pagan nation. Mm -hmm. And uh, Israel has to be in there in order for the prophecy of Jesus. Here. Yes. That is a prophecy. Absolutely, it is. Uh, it's the new covenant. Still, yeah. Yes. So. And you can make this distinction that Paul never calls you Israelites. Yeah. 1928 is the verse. In Luke 22, 28, same thing. And the Luke, and Luke and one is even clearer. He says, I covenant with you to give you the kingdom. Not just I give. This is the new covenant. To give you the kingdom. 19, uh, this is Luke 22, 28. The covenant is involved. This is the Jesuitic covenant, if you like. You have the Abrahamic covenant. You have the Noachic covenant about the, uh, the rainbow before that. You have the Mosaic covenant, which is only a temporary uh, custodial thing until you get the fullness of the Jesuitic covenant, which is Luke 22, 28. Uh, 28, yep. 29, and 30 yes. has, you will sit on thrones governing, administering the yeah. regathered yes. 12 tribes of right. Israel. I hope the translation of it there makes that clear. So Israel has two, two meanings. Israelites is not what you are. Paul speaks of now blinded ethnic Israel, Israel Israelites. Of Israel of the flesh, as you see from Israel of the spirit. Denominations have a very difficult time dealing with two parallel truths. They tend to say, oh, I love that. I got it. Now they'll exclude the opposite and equally important truth. So this is very clear. 
You are the Israel of God, you're the Israel of the Spirit, as distinct from Israel of God. What verse is that? It says we're the Israel of God. As Galatians 6.16. 6. Galatians 6.16. 6. And 1 Corinthians 10.18 speaks of the Israel of the flesh. He says, consider the Israel of the flesh. He could have said Israelites. Same word. In Romans he uses the word Israelites. You're not Israelites. You're the Israel of God, the spiritual Israel. Unless you happen to be Jewish. Unless you happen to be Jewish, then you are still the Israel of God. You're the true Israel, but you come from a Jewish background. That doesn't count anymore. <coughs> that really doesn't matter. Just that it might be a side <coughs> question. In Micah mm. 4, mm. the verses 7 and 8, mm -hmm. the Lord will reign over Israel yes. in Mount Zion. Yes. Even the former dominion will come. Yes. The kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Yes. What's that? Well, of course, the kingdom of God was there in the Old Testament. In the, in the reign of David, the, it's the kingdom of God in the hands of David. The text is in Chronicles somewhere. The kingdom of God, kingdom of the Lord, in the hands of David. We had the kingdom of God. It was right there, ruled by David, and it's going to be restored. That's exactly thy kingdom come. If you want to comment on the Lord's Prayer, that's exactly that text in Micah. It, it, is this yeah. the Israel of the flesh being governed by... No. Israel as is, the is Spirit is going to be ruling the, the world. The Lord will reign over Israel. Oh, I see. In Mount okay. Zion, says yes. Micah. Okay. And the former mm -hmm. kingdom or dominion, yes. he was told. He calls the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. Yes. I don't. Well, it's uh, it's always God's kingdom when you've got a Davidic monarch ruling it. Jesus will be the one you're going to rule with him. It's going to be restored. Thy kingdom come is may Micah four be. Restored, obviously, that must be it. I think part of his point is that that Jerusalem is going to be the center yes. of this kingdom and of the center of, mm -hmm. of the world Absolutely. at that time. Absolutely. And it's, it's Luke 19. They're standing close. To, I love this in Luke 19. It's so clear. They're standing next to Jerusalem and they think, wow, the kingdom is coming. Of course. They didn't say, well, now we can all go to heaven. The going to heaven thing is the wreckage in the system. My cousin John Robinson at Cambridge said, heaven in the Bible is nowhere, in fact, the destination of the dying. Nobody listen, because people don't listen to theologians generally. They press on with the kingdom. We get rid of the kingdom language. They're standing next to Jerusalem in Luke 19. It's a great place to start in explaining this to your friends. They thought the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. Why? Because he's standing next to the, to the throne in the capital. The Lord God, in Luke 133, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, who also wrote, ruled over the kingdom of, of Israel. It did. The kingdom of God in the hands of the children of David. And Jesus is the supreme example of that. It's wonderful stuff. Can I? Yeah. So you make an interesting point. So mm. uh, people are going to want to go to. Zion, mm. Jerusalem, not yes. heaven. No, of course. So you got Ze Zechariah mm. 8. Mm -hmm. That says the Lord of hosts, it will yet be, yes. so at that time, yes. peoples will come, yes. even the inhabitants of many cities, the inhabitants of one will go to <coughs> another saying, let us go at <coughs> once to <coughs> heaven, no. no, to entreat the favor It's just silly, God. unfortunately, this is the state and of ignorance. And where so many yes. peoples, mighty nations will yes. come to seek God yes. in Jerusalem. In heaven? No, no, in Jerusalem. To entreat right. the favor of God. Absolutely in those days, right. ten men from all the nations will grasp the garment of a Jew, mm -hmm. saying, let us go to heaven. No. <laughs> let us go with you for whatever. So this is a great... That going passage. to heaven at death is, the, heaven is the greatest coup ever effected by the devil. Mm -hmm. Once you have an immortal soul, it's got to go somewhere when you die. So the pagan notion that you are innately immortal, which you're not, that's a very clever idea. There's so many often, mansions up there. Many mansions there in heaven, so and you're going to polish people. rainbows. I'm quoting Billy Graham uh, deliberately. We're going to polish rainbows and prepare heaven editions in heaven at death. It's false. It's false, and it's not doing you any good to believe falsehoods. It's killing you. It just doesn't get you salvation believing in error, because you're to believe in the truth. And you're not, not only believing, you're to have a passion for the truth in order to be saved. Just to go back to, uh, quickly to yeah. one of the questions you Well, I'm just going to read yeah. some of what's online here. For Please. <laughs> Diane says, priests would help teach those who don't know God's ways. Absolutely. Okay. Randy says, Jesus is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Yes. Melchizedek was a priest in the most 
of the Most High God, yes. not God Himself. Yes, that's so a good that's point. Another whole other that's thing. a great point, and that reminds me. There's a very good text about what is the function of a priest in answer to your question. Some there were in Malachi. You've got a very good definition. What is the priest supposed to do? He's supposed to be God's representative. It has such language. The priest in Malachi, he's supposed to be a teacher and, and helper of other people. I've forgotten exactly the verse there. It's right in Malachi. Could be. What does it say there? Uh, for the priest's lips That's should it. keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth. For yes. he is the angelos. Yes, the messenger. The, the messenger. Yes. Of the God of hosts. Yes, Malachi exactly. Malachi 7. Malachi 2.7 Malachi 2, 7 is, is exactly, he's supposed to... And, and nothing set. in there said he will go to an altar <coughs> and slay an animal. No, and no. It's not that. No. It's that not would so work so in the Old Testament, it will not work in the New. Except, of course, there will be a, a restored temple in the Millennium where they will be offering sacrifices. Yeah. And people say, why would that be... It, it's it almost be. like the word priest is... Yeah. It should be the word minister, yes, or pastor, Why not? or one of those kind yes. of things that yeah. applies to. It's going to have a different function at different times, depending on where Just you quickly, are. Just quickly, uh, about the political thing about yep. uh, uh, rejecting uh, nationalism, patriotism. Dan uh, Shaw said, "So, what about the idea to give Caesar what is Caesar's?" Absolutely. So, how do we That's work exactly. There's a big long discussion on here about taxes. That's not what our topic is. No. Today. But that's very easy. You ought to pay taxes to whom taxes are due is to do it. Do not resist that. Say, well, I don't like what they do with those taxes. That's not your business. You are to pay taxes. You are to honor people, certainly honor the police force. Be very, very <coughs> grateful for those who fight and defend us. Absolutely. Romans but you're not part of that system. That's Romans 13. Romans 13. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. Getting all that worked out is difficult. And right. I think we're all in process there. Try to get it clear. Okay, we've got the priest in the priest lips. Yeah, there was should one be other thing that what else? Said. Mm -hmm. Let me see. I lost it. There is one olive tree of which we yes. um uh, I don't think it. some branches were broken off yes. and we, the wild branches, yes. were grafted in. It all stems on the promise made to Abraham of yes. which we are all his seed Good. in the Messiah. Beautiful. So speaking of Absolutely. us as the holy Right. That's exactly Actually, right. Peter goes on to, if you want to finish up mm -hmm. the chat, goes yes. on to talk about honor all men, mm -hmm. love the brother, mm -hmm. fear God, honor the king. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that we're, our allegiance is being transferred to the king. It simply means be respectful, I think. Oh, yes. You want to finish up the chapter? Eight Absolutely. Eight? Let's finish the chapter. I think we're coming to a nice harmony in all of this. Uh, first Peter, two chapter eight. One, two, rather. Two thirteen. I was trying to get up to eleven and twelve, possibly. I urge you. This would be I strong, strongly urge you, as aliens and strangers. Your passport had better very definitely not read USA primarily. Your first allegiance is to the King of the Kingdom of God. I get that. So you are then aliens and strangers in eleven to abstain from fleshly lust, which wage war. That's very striking against the self, the soul. Keep your behavior excellent. We did that among the Gentiles, so that in, in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, for instance, if you give up believing in the Trinity, you're going to be slandered as a non-believer. We have an example of that just recently. So you are going to be spoken evil of because of your good deeds as they observe them, Glorify God in the day of visitation. Yes, in the future, when their chance at salvation comes, the day of visitation, when God intervenes, they're going to act rightly, partly because of what you showed as an example now, would be the sense. Yeah. It's very striking. And then 13, we won't do the rest of it, I think, at the moment. Submit yourself to the Lord's sake. Every human, and that means you don't have a choice about paying taxes, you pay them. You are to keep the speed laws. Officially, that's absolutely clear. Otherwise, you will get attacked and rightly, so you don't do that. All governments, as sent by God, sent, that doesn't mean they're Christians, of course, they're commissioned by God. Government, thankfully, is commissioned by God for the punishment, that's not your job, the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. Of course, the policeman is very pleased if you keep the laws, He's, his job is being done for him. I think that's absolutely clear. I think it's very beautiful and very, very obvious, the sense there. We've got time to finish. Okay, we can go on to 20 or 20. Okay, it's three men.
do not use your freedom as covering for evil. Now, I was sent a list of the salaries of about 25, 30 leading preachers, and they're quite honestly, ostentatiously disgusting. The value of some of these people who have made money out of religion. You don't want to be ostentatious if you're some leading religious person, but they have put religion in a very bad light. Do not use your freedom as a covering for evil. That could be said of some leading preachers. They're using that freedom to preach for a covering for all sorts of evil, but also use it, or rather, use it rather as a bond slave of God. That's good, isn't it? A slave, a servant. You're trying to help other people, not yourself, mainly. Honour all people. This is very all-encompassing. It's very decent. I think everybody agrees with this. Honour everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. There's an element of fear in God. You're to have a fear, a proper fear of God. And you're to honour the king. Royalty is in the news, as you know, in England. Most many Americans have a, a sort of a tender affection for the royal family. That's not entirely displaced because Jesus is the ultimate king. You see something about kingship there. However badly done, it's better than nothing, one might think. What else have we got? Servants, right? It means servants, employees of all sorts. Paul doesn't try to abolish slavery, but he tells people how to do the servant and master thing properly. Servants, be submissive to your masters, your employers, with all respect, not only the ones who are good and gentle, but also those who are unreasonable. Isn't that marvelous? As far as you can. Well, except in the yeah. South, when there was slavery, that wasn't yeah. marvelous. That was all. all the, they all used this scripture mm -hmm. and this thing to um, do all kinds of evil with, yes. the, with their slaves and mistreat them. That is them. unthinkable. They didn't teach them the whole Bible, and they wouldn't no. let them read. So they only learned right. this bit. That's all they taught them. That's very um, awful. And it's disgusting. Because elsewhere he says, employers, be very gentle and kind and fair with your employees. They they didn't do that. They weren't told that was atrociously bad. Was and the idea of Americans war. killing each other in war. a civil war is unspeakable, low point of nonsense in the nation's history. And Britain is no better because they did the same sort of thing. Okay, so I love this then. For this finds favor, in verse 19, for the sake of conscience towards God, if a person bears up <coughs> under sorrows when suffering unjustly. What about Michael Servetus, who's... Mm -hmm brass or bronze statue we recently visited en masse close to Geneva and this pathetic figure really gazing forlornly in, into the future the, the face is very expressive and alongside there was a man sitting and I said does anybody know who this is and he immediately said j'aime l'histoire, j'adore l'histoire I love history he said so I said to the public as they were walking by shopping and there was a little what do you call that? A roundabout? Carousel. Carousel, running merrily about two yards from this man. Oh. And the man said, nobody has any idea who he is. What? Well, Calvin, the murderer, the serial murderer, so I wouldn't recommend you join a Calvinist church, don't want to be friends with murderers, had had this man burned at the stake. And there was then put up a notice in French there where it says, we are grateful to Calvin, but we are offering this statute as a, what was the word? Expiatory. Ex, expiatory. Monument. And I was admitting this was a terrible sin. But it says that Calvin was a man of his time. So that's what we did in those days. We burned people. That's yeah. unspeakable. It will get no traction in the judgment at all. No. Calvin yeah, knew as well as any, any human being. It's, it's, it's disgusting. Yeah. Calvin will have to take responsibility for burning a fellow believer. A very brilliant one. And there is his little monument in Anmas, close to Geneva. Go there and ponder how awful religion can be. It's worse than atheism when done wrong. Okay, so that takes us then towards the end of the section. But what credit is there if, in verse 20, when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? None. But if when you do what is right, maintaining your belief in the truth, and you suffer for that, and impatiently endure it, this finds favour with God. Isn't that neat? God is smiling on that sort of thing. Mm. You put up with it patiently when they say you're a heretic. And but yet God allows it. He allows it. 
because the opposite would be Calvinism, right? You're all programmed to do exactly what God programmed you to do. That's unspeakable. I think this is a beautiful doctrine that you have an element of freedom. We don't have freedom to do certain things that are obviously never going to happen. In my case, as a non-citizen, I'm limited, and yet we do have God's blessing if we patiently put up with attacks from others. So that gets us to the end of uh, that section of Peter, if we'll leave it for that for the moment. I just wanted to read you the quote from J.T. Robinson to remind you... You know, that, there's three or four more verses. Uh, are we not up to 21? Turn your page. 25. Turn your page. Okay. Uh, he never <laughs> sinned. Uh, when he was cursed, he did not curse back. Yes. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but Good. committed himself to the one, mm -hmm. not the three, mm -hmm. who judges justly. Mm -hmm. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, that we, having died to sins, might live to uprightness. Mm -hmm. By his being wounded, you were healed, for you were going astray like sheep. But now you have returned to the pastor and superintendent of your souls. You, yes. That's your paraphrase. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Shepherd there is pastor. And Jesus is your pastor, by the way. Think of that. Your pastor is firstly Jesus. Whoever you may have placed yourself under, you better be sure that he sounds like Jesus. And you urge him in a gentle way to preach on the gospel of the kingdom all the time. To preach on the one God of Israel and the Messiah Jesus all the time. And then in the judgment, God will say to him, you sounded like Jesus. You sounded awfully like my son. If you don't mention the kingdom of God gospel all the time, you don't sound like Jesus. You might want to be in fear of having not represented Jesus well. Okay, it takes us to, to what, 25? Yeah. Yeah. Shepherd and guardian, superintendent, guardian, my margin there has uh, overseer. Yes, guardian could be overseer. This reminds me of what Paul says in Romans, I think, about you, oh. you, are, uh, you are like sheep. Yes. To the slaughter. Yes. So that's, that's a high bar, isn't it, to be like sheep in this present yes. evil age? Yes, it is. Like Michelle was saying, all kinds of horrible things God is allowing yes. to happen to so many innocents. And Absolutely. And it might happen to Christians. Yes. So, but we've got to tough it out. As in, I, yes. I love that, uh, love that. The, the verse 21, mm -hmm. but he committed himself to the one. Mm -hmm. So when he suffered... Mm -hmm. He committed all those sufferings. They spat in his face, demeaning. Yes. Especially for a man. To be slapped is demeaning for a man. I was slapped once by another man. And, Quite uh, demeaning. It, it's, but you have to contain yourself, yes. not threaten, yeah. not strike back, yeah. and commit yourself to the one. Yeah. I love that. that I mean, it's, oh. you said high bar, forget the bar. It's like it's very the bar, bar is in Pluto. Yes, but if you're training your Navy SEALs, you have a right to do that. He wants to see what we are made of before he lets us loose on the nations to rule them with a rod of iron and discipline the world. That will take a while. So that takes us then to a good point in the <coughs> chapter, the end of it, in fact. So we'll do chapter 3. Chapter 3 is going to be fascinating. We're talking about the angels who sinned, the spirits in prison to whom Jesus preached not when he was dead, and this is where your death is death doctrine comes in very uh, By the way, for, for Tom, Tom, yes. uh, the ERV has a good paraphrase on the priest, uh, mm -hmm. Ma uh, Malachi 2 7. Okay, what does it say? Uh, a, priest, a priest should know God's teachings. Mm -hmm. People should be able to go to a priest and learn his teachings. Good. A priest should be the Lord's messenger to the people. Excellent. Like that. That's a nice definition of priesthood, isn't it? Good. Okay, do you have a song for us, Sarah, or what? Um, or what? Yeah. It's a change. Or you what? Song. Any suggestions? Mm -hmm. Oh, let me see the list. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> or hey, what? Father, um, Let's see. Let's see. Onward, Christian song. Yes. You packed a lot into that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. On your onward Christian soldiers? How about that? Yeah. In light of Memorial Day, which I'm just telling doesn't like some of us. Oh, that's fine. Memorial Days, whatever we're honoring, we're honoring. We're honoring servicemen who gave their lives Absolutely. and were died in combat. So Absolutely. Our, 
peace in this country. I think they should be on it. So. Uh, 413, mm -hmm. onward Christian soldiers. I know Carlos has a kind of an anti-patriotic mm. view. I just don't I do. want everybody out there to think that we all no. are sharing that view because no. we don't. So yeah. it's uh, I don't want him to think that we are a group that hates America or hates no, no. the country you're in. No, no, well, I don't, I don't hate. The I know you don't hate, hate but no. I'm just saying people yeah. can take that oh, yeah. as who knows what out there. Yeah. And, Sure. Yeah. Land. But they can write to us so, and, and interact with us and all I, of that. I'm proud to be an American. And yes. I think mm -hmm. Paul was mm -hmm. pretty okay with being a Roman. I mean, oh, absolutely. He used his really, really used it. It. Right. Yeah, I would too. I'd use my British, I'd rush to the consulate. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Subjects that has been uh, 
dealt with today. May many out there hear these things and rejoice in the Bible study.